Christian, I had a few slides to share just for the introduction. So if you can allow me to. Uh... Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, or good day, good night, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to this um, Quantum Limits of Knowledge conference. It's great to see that there are, there are so many people joining us. Um, as a quick introduction, I just wanted to, uh, to give a bit of background for, for this conference. So it's the, the second edition of uh, what we hope may become a series of conferences uh, after the first one that was organized in uh, Copenhagen two years ago. And the idea was really to, <clears throat> to, uh, to gather um, physicists, both experimentalists and uh, theorists and philosophers and have them discuss various um, issues on quantum foundations and quantum limits of knowledge. Um, apparently, I wasn't there, but apparently the, the first edition was, uh, was a great success. The participants were very happy about it, and they, were, they wanted to, uh, to organize a second edition. So they kindly asked Alexia to, um, to organize it. And so this is how we got uh, involved in Grenoble. Um, so of course, we wanted to invite you in Grenoble, uh, or maybe in the mountains around. Unfortunately, the, the situation did not uh, allow us to do that. Um, so <clears throat> that's why we have this um, this meeting online. Uh, I just wanted to uh, to warmly thank Christian who who really took the the lead for the organization. So he's he's really the, the organizer of the of the conference. So any any question about the, the organization, any complaint, you should go to him. But most importantly, all the um, all the credit should should go to him. Um, I also had the slide with uh, the, the logos of the sponsors, but uh, I think we should uh, just acknowledge the, the funding that we have from, um, from a project in uh, Grenoble on uh, quantum engineering, which is a, a highly interdisciplinary project, which funds mostly uh, PhDs, but also what we call uh, chairs of excellence. And we have a chair of excellence in the philosophy of physics held by uh, Vincent Lam, and uh, this is in, in this context that we, that we can organize this, um, this conference. Um, I think I'll keep the introduction short. Uh, any of the org other organizers, did you want to, to add something? Otherwise, we, we will start with the, the first talk of the morning which will be given by, uh, by Nicolas, Nicolas Gisin. He probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but he's a, a physicist, both a theorist and experimentalist, who likes to do philosophy on the weekend. So he's Nicolas. You will talk about, I, I don't have the, the title now, but uh, about intuitionistic mathematics, I think. So should I share my screen now? Oh, but I cannot. So. Uh, Someone has to allow me to share my screen. Uh, you, you, I think you can now. Yes. Okay. Yes, so now you should see it. Do you see my screen? And the title, Cyril, my title is Time in Physics and Intuitionistic Mathematics. Forget about the time. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So, well, thank you very much for organizing this second uh, edition of this uh, workshop. Indeed, I enjoyed the first one very much, and I'm looking forward to, to this one. <laughs> I have to say that uh, this weekend I was uh, with a very, very bad uh, cold, and my head was completely uh, stuffed. And um, yesterday I couldn't speak. My was, voice was completely uh, broken, but I hope that today it will, it will work out. I see that I get messages from people waiting in the waiting room. So I guess someone is going to let them in or do I have to let them in? Let me admit Karl Hoefner. Yeah, I guess. 
Okay, so what, what is time? What are so my motivations behind all that? Um, okay, it seems that now I have to let all the people in at the same time. It's kind of amusing <laughs> way of. You don't, you don't have to worry, uh, then They should. They they will be. They will be let in automatically after a while. Don't worry. Okay. Okay, because it all appears now on my screen. Okay, so if you ask now a, a physicist, in, I'm, I'm a physicist or serial set, so I'm interested in time in physics, I would like to be able to describe it. So of course, the first thing is to go and ask physicists, what is time? And the answer that one would get is oh, time is merely a evolution parameter. Maybe some people will say, oh, it is a geometric uh, coordinate. And all these answers are to me, uh, sound very lean. Um, so let's try to go a bit further. And for instance, I went to the uh, internet and typed passage of time. And I got this painting that you see here. To this, okay. Here you probably see my laser pointer. Uh, this, this painting uh, from uh, Dreidre Adams. And I think that indeed, if you watch and stare at this picture, you see that something is happening, something is going on. It's, I think, a nice picture of the passage of time. But of course, now to make time in physics out of this uh, painting is uh, yet another story. So let's continue with this uh, uh, motivation. Um, uh, Saint Augustine is famous for having uh, written that uh, if nobody asks me, he knows, Augustine knows. Um, but if I were desirous to explain it, plainly, I do not know. Not very useful, but I think quite accurate. Okay, so what is time? So for me, my prejudice would be the following. First, time is not only what clock measures. What clock measures is something that we may call the Parmenides or geometric time. It's time when what matters is being. But another way of approaching time is more, ah yeah, first if you go then and look at how artists uh, draw clocks, you already see that clocks is not what you see in train stations. And another way of uh, representing time is more like this uh, sand clock here. And he, very interestingly and uh, relevant for today's talk is that the order in which this grain of sands pass from the top to the bottom is not predetermined. It's a chaotic system. So it's not clear which grand sand will be the first, the second, and so on and so on. So there is some chaos here in. But that gives you a better intuition maybe about what I would like to call um, Heraclitus or creative time. So time is also the accumulation of little events. Every grain of sand is a little event or its passage through this uh, central node is a little event. So in this Heraclitus creative time, uh, what matters is change. And if you have really something which is non-deterministic here, then there is a time before and there is a time after a non-necessary event. So in this sense, this sort of time, this creative time, is uh, something, is, an, is, a, is a concept of time that requires indeterminism. Although we'll see later that we can also give a deterministic model that mimic this indeterminism by adding supplementary or hidden variables. Okay, and let me just continue with motivations. Physicists produce models of reality. I guess we all know that. And uh, these models should be as faithful as possible. In particular, we should give correct empirical predictions. But that's not enough. If we would just have correct empirical predictions and nothing more, then the explanatory power of these models would be empty. So we need also that these models of reality allow humans to tell stories about how nature does it. And there is no way to tell a story or tell stories without the passage of time. As Yuval Dolev put it, to think of an event is to think of something in time. 
So maybe here one could summarize all that, paraphrasing uh, Rabelais with uh, following, science without time is but ruin of intelligibility. A third kind of motivation comes from this big tension that we have in today's physics with on the, on the left here, relativity, which leads to uh, the block universe uh, picture where everything is fixed since ever and forever. And on the right hand side, we have the second main uh, theory of physics, quantum theory with quantum randomness, which requires new information that gets created as time passes. And this is maybe this tension is also nicely illustrated in this uh, video on YouTube by uh, Sabine Hoffenfelder, who has a lot of, uh, of these videos and most of them alike. Uh, but in this one, she is, okay, it's maybe nice because she's very extreme. So she starts by saying, you are here, here to hear what science says. We know the future is determined by the present. And she even concludes, if you think otherwise, you are denying scientific evidence. So a super strong statement, um, which really follows from the block universe point of view, but of course is in complete uh, contradiction with uh, quantum randomness, or randomness in general, in particular in quantum randomness. Now the way um, uh, Sabine Hoffenfelder presents that is really that uh, we are just watching it playing out. So we are watching the universe playing it out. So it's like being in a movie or being in a cinema and watching a movie. And indeed, when we watch a movie and we would all love to be again able to go and watch movies in, in cinemas, uh, and we can feel the time passing, no doubt that we feel the time passing, but the we here are the spectators. So time passes for the spectators, but not for the characters on the bobbin. The characters on the bobbin, nothing happens for them. And now if we are uh, thinking of, uh, the, of the universe as being the bobbin, uh, then there is no spectator. We are the characters on the bobbin. So time wouldn't pass and would completely contradict all of our feelings. So this kind of picture is, I believe, just misleading. Still, that doesn't answer how to describe time in physics. So in a few years ago with uh, my uh, co-author, Flavio Del Santo, we were trying to uh, address this question, how to describe passage of time or indeterminism in physics. And by doing so in this physical review A paper, we were somehow uh, reinventing without knowing it, intuitionism or intuitionistic mathematics um, and then, okay, we discovered that this was already known uh, since a century about this form of mathematics. And so now I want to tell you a bit about intuitionism um, and why this form of mathematics, so it's a language, uh, could be very useful in physics to describe the passage of time and to describe indeterminism. So here's the first encounter. Numbers are there to count, one, two, three, four. Good, but then how can it be that most of the so-called real numbers are not computable? Let me just try to define some integers. Very simple, actually it will even be bits, just zero and ones. Let me first define n1 equals zero. If every even integer between four and 10 to the power four is the sum of two primes and n1 equal one over wise. So probably most of you don't know the value of n1, but every one of us could go to his computer in a couple of minutes, uh, or tens of minutes, depending on, on the ability with computers, you will find out that actually n1 is equal to zero. So whether we know n1 or not is not the question, but n1 has a value. Now we can change a bit the definition and define n2 uh, if every, equals zero if every integer between four and a huge number is the sum of two primes and n2 equal one otherwise. So here we still don't know the value of n2 and here it's not sufficient to go to a computer because this number is so large that it will take 
an enormous time, but it's a finite time. So after a finite time, our, our computer would give us an answer. Um, although we don't know the answer, there's no doubt that there is an answer. So N2 has a value, possibly zero, possibly one, unknown, but fixed, determined. Let me go to the next one, N3 equals zero. If every integer larger than four, without any upper bounds, up to infinity, if you like, is the sum of two primes, uh, and otherwise N3 equal one. So this is equivalent yeah. to the, yes? Excuse me, it's Alexia in here, um, and it's not for a smart question, but I guess there is there are people in the waiting room. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Yes, and what should I do? Uh, uh, let them. Sorry, Alexia. So maybe um, let me pause for one second. The yes, recording. please. Yeah, I'm going to pause the recording of the video. Oh, I am here. Okay, so I hope you are still with me. Um, yeah, so I was defining this number n three but now there is no upper bound. So clearly there is no finite uh, method to compute N3, or more precisely, there is no known finite method to compute N3. Nevertheless, if I ask any of you whether N3 has a determined value, either zero or one, I mean, you're all going to tell me, of course it has a determined value. Uh, and I would certainly also have answered like that uh, some times ago, a couple of years ago because we have all been selected by all the academic system that uh, to learn uh, to, uh, to answer positively to such a question, we have all been trained uh, uh, to believe in the law of the excluded middle. So any, uh, every student, at least who is going to not to fail the exam, uh, will uh, claim that N3 has a determined value. And here comes exactly intuitionistic mathematics if the exam is in intuitionistic mathematics, then the student should answer that the value of N3 is indeterminate. So N3 can have three values, zero, one, or indeterminate. And in intuitionistic mathematics, we'll see more about that, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And there's even more in uh, intuitionistic mathematics, namely, the value of N3 may evolve over time. This is super counterintuitive for everyone who has learned something in mathematics. Numbers can evolve. For instance, here in this example, and this example really goes back to the Brouwer, the father of intuitionism. You know, if someone proves or disproves this Kolbach conjecture, then the number N3 may evolve from indeterminate to determinate. Let's continue to look at intuitionistic mathematics and which uh, the standpoint. So Karl Posse, who is a philosopher in, in Jerusalem, wrote, we humans have finite memories, finite attention spans and finite lives. So we can fully grasp only finitely many finite sized pieces of a compound thing. There is no infinite helicopter allowing us to survey the whole terra or to tell how things will look at the end of time. You can also read what uh, Ered Bishop, a famous uh, constructive mathematic mathematicians wrote, the classicist, so the standard mathematician, wishes to describe God's mathematics. The constructivist to describe the mathematics of finite beings, man's mathematics for short. Constructive mathematics does not postulate a pre-existing universe with objects lying around waiting to be collected and grouped into sets like shells on a beach. And Brouwer himself wrote, nature simply has not yet fully determined all objects. This can be compared to the uncertainty principle used in quantum uh, mechanics. So the essence of intuitionism is really that even mathematical objects may be uh, undetermined and may evolve. Now, probably several of you get worried. How, how could there be things, including math mathematical objects, that are not fully determined? 
maybe I should here calm your worries by stating that with intuitionistic mathematics, you can compute and prove theorems. Well, not always, as we shall see, the same theorems as in classical mathematics are not always following the same proof. But for sure, everything one can do on a classical computer, particular, so all of physics, can also be done with intuitionistic mathematics. Hence, all of physics can be done. And actually, if you look at one of the very timely uh, uh, domain in physics, namely uh, climate physics, how do people in climate physics model the climate? We have only finite computers, huge but finite computers. And when we let the, this uh, simulation of the climate evolve, uh, we need then uh, more digits, more information that we could not put into the initial condition because it's a finite computer and also because their measurements is finite anyway. So what we use is truncated numbers and stochastic reminders. So actually these people doing this climate physics somehow they use, without knowing it, intuitionistic mathematics. And it's clear that uh, the uh, now it's again something with zoom that part of my screen gets eaten by some other things, but okay. So the, the mathematical language we speak has a huge influence on the worldview that it presents on, to us. So we all know that we speak uh, English, we speak French or Danish or Russian or German, whatever. And there are clearly ideas that are easier to express in one language than in another one. And it's the same actually with these different mathematical languages. And for instance, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has it like that. The dependence of intuitionism on time is essential. Statements can become provable in the course of time and therefore might become intuitionistically valid while not having been so before. So Brouwer, the, the father of intuitionism, introduced into his mathematics the concept of an ideal mathematician. Sometimes he was also talking about the creating subject who continually produces new information by solving mathematical conjectures. Okay, but this sounds very uh, subjectivist and actually Brouwer was a pretty strange character who got in fights with many people, and he was almost a, a solipsist. And this is very far from being a, you know, a physicist or a naive realist. So I don't want an ideal mathematician or a creating a subject. So I'll go, I'm going to present uh, intuitionism without these ideal mathematicians and motivate it by the physical concept of indeterminism. It is very likely that Brouwer would not have liked my presentation. After all, I'm not a solipsist for sure, I'm a physicist and possibly a naive realist. And the main claim of my presentation is that intuitionistic mathematics is the natural mathematical tool to describe the passage of time and indeterminism in physics. Like derivative is a natural mathematical tool to describe velocities. So let's take an example and uh, I'll take an example from a, a chaotic classical dynamical system in which the state space is just a number between zero and one. And uh, one time step is described, it's essentially the Baker's map, probably most of you know about it. You stretch that and then you fold it back. So mathematically it is this function and this function is very nicely uh, represented if you write the, the variable here, x, in binary format, because then this transformation is just a shift. The second bit becomes the first one. The first bit here, b1, you drop. The third one becomes the second. The fourth one becomes the third, and so on. So we see that there is sensitivity to the initial condition because as time passes, uh, you need to go down the, the series of bits to know the main bit. So whether x lies on the left half or the right half after n steps clearly depends on the nth bit, the n of the initial condition. And you could imagine that this is the probability of uh, rain. Um, and um, 
Now the question is whether this millionth or billionth bits of the initial condition is physically real. Of course, if we adopt classical mathematics, yes, it is real. Uh, a real number, everything is given at once. But if you follow my intuition and, and Brouwer and intuitionism, uh, then you start understanding that possibly this billionth or millionth bit is not physically real, but becomes real as time passes. Let's ask the question, what is uh, the question, will it be raining in exactly one year time from now at the Piccadilly Circus? And of course, you may think, oh, this is already determined. I don't know whether it's going to rain or not, but it is already fixed. It's already determined. Or you may say, this is not only unknown, but undetermined. But of course, as time passes before in a year time, it will be determined that it will rain or not rain at Piccadilly Circus. Um, so we see that things have to get determined as time passes. So here to, to come back to my little example, the question is not whether this millionth bit can be measured, but whether it corresponds to something physical. So let's just look a bit at these typical real numbers that we use all the time in physics. And actually, the first thing to realize is that all real numbers one encounters are actually exceptional. They are exceptional because they have a name and they are defined by a finite algorithm, like square root of two pi or fractions like that. But the bits of a typical real number have no structure at all. The bits are random. And let me really emphasize, they are as random as quantum measurement outcomes. There are really exactly no structure in them. So the best way actually to think of a typical real number is just the outcome of a possibly quantum or for sure a true random number generator. Now again, since there only counter be many names and algorithms, a typical real numbers needs to contain an infinite amount of incompressible information. And this was illustrated by uh, Emile Borel, uh, noticing that in one real number, one can quote the answers to all questions one can formulate in any human language. So you really see how much information, unbounded information you have in, in a real number. And so as uh, Gregory Chatin was uh, emphasizing, there's only one way of thinking of a typical real number, and it is really the outcome of a random number generator. So for instance, when in physics we say, let x0 be a real number, what we're effectively saying is, let x0 denote an infinite amount of information. So mathematical real numbers are not physically real, they are actually physically random. And these random numbers should be at the basis of scientific determinism. That sounds strange. So the intuition is that these numbers, of course, initially, the first digits are fully determined. Then they become a bit blurred, or only partially determined. Come back to that in a more precise way. And then if you go down the series of bits or digits, they are fully indeterminate. Now, once you have this indeterminacy, you may say, okay, that's uh, not so nice maybe. So let's add supplementary variables. That was the reaction that uh, scientists uh, uh, had when faced with quantum indeterminacy. So we could indeed say that instead of God playing dice when potentialities become actual, God played all dice at the initial time and coded all results in the initial condition. So we face a choice, either the fact that at present certain things happen and other do not, is interpreted as revealing retroactively information about long past initial conditions, or else we understand the present as the result of indeterminate reality and the future as open. So we can really choose, either we go to if classical mechanics, uh, classical mathematics, sorry, and everything is in the initial condition with infinite information therein, 
or we have this intuitionistic viewpoint, uh, which allows time to really pass and objects and events to evolve. So from this point of view, and that was essentially my presentation at the first issue of uh, this uh, series of workshop, Quantum Limits of Knowledge, we can now consider real numbers as the hidden variables of classical mechanics. And uh, interestingly, uh, there is the fact that almost all physicists accept real numbers without noticing that they are supplementary variables, while the same uh, physicist would simultaneously reject Bohmian positions, which would be the equivalent additional or supplementary variables uh, for quantum mechanics. And so physicists usually reject Bohmian positions as unnecessary while accepting the real numbers, although they are also unnecessary. And both, by the way, are inaccessible and both contain infinite information. So whether Newtonian classical mechanics is deterministic or not is not a scientific question. Actually, it depends on the physical significance one associates with mathematical real numbers or on the mathematical language one uses. So you see that intuitionism brings classical closer to quantum. I think this is an important comment. One usually tries, I mean, most people try to bring quantum closer to classical with the idea, or oh, we understand classical, we don't understand quantum, let's make quantum more classical, we'll understand it better. But I think actually classical, if you now talk uh, intuitionistic mathematics, becomes much closer to quantum, and in this sense may help understanding also quantum mechanics. Okay, we know about these huge uh, debates that took place. Uh, this debate between uh, David Hilbert and Brouwer is a bit less well known. So David Hilbert probably needless to uh, introduce him, but so he is, let's say, the father of classical mathematics, uh, which states that every real number is an individual complete entity, like the shells on the beach that uh, Bishop was mentioning before. So all digits are given at once. And the continuum is a collection of individual points. So these real numbers exist outside of time in some ideal platonistic world. For Brouwer on the other side, so intuitionistic mathematics, real numbers are processes that develop in time. Digits are not all given at once, except for computable numbers. And the continuum is a viscous collection. I'll come back to that uh, um, concept of viscous collection of processes. So here time is essential. Um, at any instant, only finite information exists. So now let me formalize a bit this intuitionistic mathematics. So Brouwer, he introduced the concept and the terminology of choice sequences. So he was saying choices made by an idealized uh, mathematician. But for us, we are going to introduce the concept of a natural random process. So this is just uh, a translation of the assumption that nature has the power to produce true randomness, which is needed, I believe, for the passage of time. So nature has really the power to produce new information. I don't really see how we could be talking about this creative time without such a power of nature. Now, this natural random uh, process produces at each uh, instant, and there are a discrete number of instants labeled by this integer n, and let's say it just produces bits to make it simple. So r n are zero and ones, and then these ones can be processed in order to produce these sequences. So at each uh, time step or instance, and a natural random uh, uh, process outputs some random numbers. And then there is a computable function uh, that takes the previous element of this choice sequence, the time, and all the existing information at that time, and produces a computable number, alpha n. So these are the elements of this choice sequence. So I assume that this function is computable. You see that this is important. And uh, I'll assume, so Brouwer was saying it, 
uh, that the theory converges with uh, certainty I'm changing that a bit and this is maybe a bit a, a weak point mathematically with probability one because I would have to argue that probabilities can be done only with rational or computable numbers. So I want some convergence here. So let's have some examples. The first example is uh, super simple. You just assume that the, the uh, nth random bit is the next bit in your series here written in, uh, in binary format. So it becomes bn is, is equal to, uh, to rn. Now, another example of intuitionistic numbers, and these are the numbers we all know very well, are computable numbers. So here the idea is that this function doesn't depend on all the existing information, but only on a, on a initial sequence up to a number k, which is a small compared to today's uh, time. And so here we have the possibility to produce pseudo random number uh, series where this initial uh, string of random bits is just the seed. And there, there is, of course, uh, the typical example of computable number is pi. And it is then de uh, defined or can be defined by this uh, algorithm here, finite algorithm. And this algorithm I have not chosen randomly, but it's a it's a specifically interesting uh, example. Of course, it takes time to run the algorithm, but every bit can be computed in a finite time. And the bits of pi may look random, no doubt about that, but actually they are all hidden in the algorithm. But here it is really uh, fascinating, I believe, that one can actually compute the nth hexadecimal of pi, so also all the bits of pi, without first computing all the previous bits. So if we come back to this example, uh, uh, will it rain at Piccadilly Circus in one year time from now? To get the answer, you have to wait a year or almost a year. You have to wait. There is no way just to jump ahead, at least if you believe in indeterminism. But for pi, it is not like that. If you want to compute the millionth bit of pi, you can directly compute this millionth bit. You don't need to first compute all the previous bits. So that really shows that the bits of pi don't come one after the other. They are already all there. So if you want pi is a determined number, or a computable number, you can directly compute it. Um, don't need time to, uh, you don't need to wait. You need time to run the algorithm, but you don't need to wait. Here comes another example, which is really the one that we developed with uh, Flavio del Santo in this PRA. Uh, and we call that uh, finite information quantities. So here the idea is again that the next bit, so the difference between alpha n and alpha n minus one is just a majority vote among the k, the k last uh, outputs of my natural random process. And so you see that, of course, there are all the bits that are already fully determined up to q, qn. So these are just uh, zero and ones. Then if the majority is already very large, there is already a, a large bias. And so the majority is not easily going to jump from one value to the other one. So you get correlations between these bits. So here you will have some propensity that these bits will eventually turn out one. And then going further after n plus k, they are totally undetermined. So if you remember, that's very close to this intuition I had where the first bits or digits are determined, fully determined, then there is a region where it gets a bit blurred, where there is a, a good chance or a propensity that the bits end up zero or one. And if you go further, they are totally undetermined. Okay, here is an example where you could compute these things. Then another example, which again goes back to, uh, to Brouwer. So it's not that I, I didn't invent this example. Um, so here you have a number and you see it is oscillating around one half, but it's oscillating, getting closer and closer and closer to one half. So uh, if Rn is uh, zero, then alpha n is slightly larger than one half, otherwise slightly smaller than one half. But then you add this following rule that goes on until by chance, let's say the last half of the random bits all happen to have the same value all zero, all ones. And of course, on ones, 
and to be even and large enough. So this is, uh, yeah, sorry. And then in this case, the series terminates or dies and then sticks to wherever it was, to the value where it was. So here we see that because the probability of terminating, of dying, if you like, uh, decreases exponentially, there is an a priori probability that the sequence goes on forever. So you could have that it goes on forever. It could be that this choice sequence settles or dies below one half, or it settles above one half. And so in this case, a proposition like alpha smaller than one half, as long as the number, this mortal number didn't die, is neither true nor false, but indeterminate. And we'll come back to that uh, when we introduce this concept of viscosity. So what time is it? Yeah. Um, so autonomous numbers. So here is a, just another uh, law for evolving. Now this one, you see that it has two uh, fixed points. If alpha n gets equal to zero, it will stick to that. Or if it gets to one, it sticks to that. So it has a certain probability to converge to one or the other. And this is interesting because if you are a bit familiar with the stochastic Schrodinger equations that you have in a GRW in a quantum state diffusion, it's the same kind of equations. But of course, here now in the context of quantum mechanics, where you see that um, your initial uh, condition may uh, settle according to these uh, stochastic modifications of the Schrodinger equation to one of the eigenstates of the measured quantity, in this case, the photon number. So again, we see that intuitionism brings classical uh, closer to quantum. So a bit of quantum uh, of intuitionistic logic. So as we already said, uh, Rn equals zero is indeterminate before the nth time step. Also, these mortal numbers have indeterminate values. Okay, I already said that. So clearly the law of the excluded middle is not valid in intuitionistic mathematics. And consequently, no non-constructive existence proof are valid. And this is certainly uh, uh, a big surprise, if not a shock to all of us, because again, we have been selected by the academic system uh, to believe in this uh, law of the excluded middle. Um, but again, if you want to describe an indeterministic world, uh, a world in which the future is open, it makes plenty of sense to reject the law of the excluded middle. So now let's describe this continuum uh, in intuitionistic mathematics. Uh, so some sequence never terminates. And so if you want to cut the continuum, let's say around one half, for instance, or any number, let's say one half, then you will have a problem with these numbers that are, have not yet died, which are still ongoing, because you don't know whether they go to below one half or to larger than one half. And as a consequence, you have this important theorem that is called the Brouwer's theorem that states that all total functions are continuous. Total means defined everywhere. So you don't have any step functions. Of course, we are used to, uh, to, to step functions in physics, but clearly we can do without step functions. It's enough to have a function that moves fast from one value to another one. And this is here while why uh, intuitionistic continuum is viscous. In some sense, you cannot pick out one element of this continuum because there are no elements in this continuum. These are processes. It's not like the shell on the beaches, the shells on the beaches. So here it is like trying to extract a, a molecule of honey out of a honey pot. It's going to stick or to be viscous. You cannot take it out. Uh, another uh, theorem, which is affected by this uh, intuitionistic view of the continuum, is the intermediate value theorem that says if you have a continuous function that starts negative, becomes positive, then it has to cross zero. Uh, however, there is another theorem which is valid uh, intuitionistically, which uh, states that a continuous function that goes from negative to positive, then there is a, an epsilon, for every epsilon, every positive epsilon, one can construct, that's the important word, 
a value x between a and b such that f of x absolute value is arbitrarily small. So this is good enough for applications in physics. And also the standard proof of Gleason's theorem is not valid intuitionistically. However, it was proven that the Gleason's theorem still is valid intuitionistically, but it requires a different uh, proof technique. So you have new theorems like this one. You have theorems that are no longer valid, but can be replaced. And you have theorems that remain, but whose proof may have to be adapted. Okay, just a little bit of arithmetics. You can, of course, add these choice sequences or compute, apply any computable function to the elements of these computable, uh, these choice sequences. Okay. Um, of course, we started a bit late, so now I don't know exactly how much time I still have, but I want to maybe jump a bit ahead because I want to... Yeah, yeah, so let me still have time for, for relativity a bit. So the mathematical language we use when speaking physics has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. I think we all understand that. And here I have just a table which compares you know, physical concepts to intuitionistic mathematics. So for instance, indeterministic physics would hold that present, past, present, and future are not all given at once. And in intuitionistic mathematics, that digits or real numbers are not all given at once. Time passes, number are processes, indeterminism, numbers contain finite information. The present is thick or uh, yeah, thick. The continuum is viscous. The future is open, no law of the excluded middle, becoming choice sequences, experiencing intuitionism. Okay, let me just finish with uh, some words about relativity, since indeed uh, uh, that's part, that's half of today's physics, let's say. So here we have an example. I want to consider the following example where uh, some bit A is indeterminate before okay, 1 p.m. in some reference frame. Uh, which means also that the proposition A equals zero has no true value. Now, after this event, let's say a quantum random number generator outputs a bit here, then clearly A is determinate and the proposition A equals zero is either true or false. And you can read more about that in this paper, again with Flavio and El Santo. So here maybe important is really to distinguish ontology from epistemology. So I'm not really talking here about whether things are known or, or not known. It's really determinate or indeterminate. Of course, you cannot know something indeterminate, but the importance is really on the ontology. So let's suppose now we look at that from, a, from somewhere else in this uh, little drawing of space time. Um, and here uh, I'm going to claim that A is also indeterminate everywhere outside this future light cone, uh, like uh, illus as illustrated here. So um, that sounds to be the most reasonable um, uh, proposition to, to, to include indeterminacy in this uh, space time in relativity, special relativity here. And now if I have a second event at a distance, possibly in a, in a reference frame, which is at rest compared to the first one, um, I would have the same story on that side. So B was undetermined and became uh, determinate. And then if I want to look at some uh, correlation, like the value of A plus B modulo two, this one is determinate only in the intersection of the future light cones, because I need A and B both to be determinate. And if I apply that now to an entangled quantum state, a singlet or whatever, uh, okay, there's a measurement, I get an outcome plus one. So then I have the state here, plus X, and because it was a singlet, tensor minus X. On the other side, if I measure Y and get again plus one, I would get this plus Y here, tensor minus Y on the other side. And it is only, in the intersection of the future light cones that the usual projection postulate is going to be valid. So we see here something very important comes out, namely that there is no wave function of the universe. You could make this uh, time slice here 
and where you would have some state here, then still a single state here, some other state here. And I think this is perfectly uh, valid, but it's a big change with respect to what we are used to. Okay, and I come to my conclusions. Okay, I already said the mathematical language we speak when talking physics impacts our worldview to the point that some conclusions one is tempted to infer from physics, like determinism and the illusion of time, are actually inspired by the language, not by the facts. And classical mathematics assumes a view from the end of time. Of course, if you look at everything from the end of time, then everything is determined. Um, the law of the excluded middle holds only if we look, uh, if we assume a look from the end of time or God's eyes view. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope you are all still with me here. Everybody disappears with the Zoom uh, presentations, but uh, I'm now ready to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nicola. And, uh, I think people are clapping. Thanks. Um, so for the questions, um, we kindly ask people to, to write their name on the chat so that we know who, who has a question and in which order. And then there were already there was already one question during the, the talk by Alexei. So Alexei, if you want to, to ask your question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Nicola. Um, this is, of course, continues this very interesting discussion on um, uh, intuitionistic numbers and physics. And uh, one can ask very big questions about what is physics and things like this. But um, the question I had was about one element of quantum mechanics, which very much depends on the assumption of continuity, um, which is the Searleson bound. The way you know the way uh, the proof goes, it uses uh, analysis, it uses operators on a continuous space, and so on. So, what happens to the Searleson bound? Does it become some sort of uh, viscous point that you cannot point out some uh, some neighborhood? Um, what is the destiny of the Searleson bound? Uh, I believe it will not change at all because it is a, a, a computable number. And don't be misled. I mean, in uh, intuitionistic um, mathematics, it's not at all the idea that you discretize uh, space or time or whatever. You have continuity. Simply the continuum is not made out of element, elementary points. It is made out of these, you may call it elementary uh, sequences or processes that evolve in time. But you would have uh, the same or very similar proof of, uh, of Searleson bound, I believe. And you also have, for instance, vector spaces, Hilbert spaces, all that exists also in intuitionistic mathematics. Um, there are some things that do not exist. For instance, if you have a, an abstract infinite dimensional Hilbert space, you can no longer prove the existence of a basis. Of course, if you have an explicit infinite dimensional Hilbert space, like L2 of R, the square integral functions, uh, then you can just construct the basis. But the non-constructive uh, existence proof no, are no longer valid. But we never use non-constructive existence proof in mathematics, and especially not for this Thiels unbound. Okay. Then there are quite a few questions. So we move to the, uh, the next one by uh, Cheslav, and then Jeremy. Cheslav. Hi, Nicola. Thanks for the talk. Um, you said that real numbers can be considered as a hidden variable. Hidden variables. Now, from the experience of the Bell's theorem, the, the point when we started to believe or disbelieve in this option in quantum mechanics was really derivations of Bell's theorems. Do you see a way to derive something which will be then experimentally um, confirmed and support the, the, the view you have? Um, well, I, I guess the short answer is no. Uh, I don't, I, I think doing classical mechanics with real numbers will be perfectly fine for all practical purposes. No fab as Bell would have said, um, but I don't have non-locality in classical mechanics. I could probably introduce a kind of fake non-locality with uh, correlated um, natural random uh, processes, but I think that would be uh, 
not coming from the physics, but just from the mathematics, contrary to Bell theorem, which is really confirmed experimentally, as you know. So uh, yes, that's a good question, but uh, I suspect the answer is negative. So I, I thought that like, more generally, it doesn't need to be non-locality, just an, any element in which we can have okay. trust. Okay, I, I can do the following. I'm not very satisfied with this answer, but I'll give it anyway. Uh, first, I would say, uh, you know, a finite volume of space cannot contain infinite information. And this, you may say, is just an assumption. It's a very natural assumption. But of course, it would rule out that, that, that real numbers are physically relevant or physically real. But then I could go on and, uh, and apply um, quantum field theory and black holes and tell you if I have infinite information in a finite volume, I would get a black hole. Uh, okay, I think it's maybe logically correct, but I don't find that super appealing as an argument. Okay, thank Keep you. Black holes uh, in the story. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I would have another question, but I leave yeah, I think for we... others. And then if there is time, I would like to come back. Yeah, uh, Jerry uh, had a question. Um, thank you, Nicola, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to avoid the big metaphysical differences we have and ask more internal for your own program. Um, I wonder whether when we think about something like uh, your stochastic differential equations or quantum state diffusion, which uses classical mathematics, your, your old expertise, would you in the future with Flavio have one, which of the following plans of research would you adopt? Do you want to keep that classical mathematics for indeterminism, but give it your intuitionist construal talking about uh, not having definite truth values for future possible courses of events, but every individual realization of the stochastic process as in normal stochastic process theory is treated with classical mathematics? Or do you want instead to really try to write an intuitionistic reconstruction of the theory of stochastic differential equations? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not so much, I have to say, I think that intuitionistic mathematics applied to classical uh, physics or to relativity is in some sense more interesting than applying it to, to, to quantum mechanics because we already have uh, indeterminacy in, uh, in quantum mechanics. So I, I don't need it. Even classical ma mathematics uh, leads to uh, indeterminacy in quantum mechanics. But now if I would have to you know, go back to a quantum state diffusion, it is very possible that I would adapt the view of uh, of jumps, instead of my continuous uh, process, this Wiener process that I used with Jan Percival uh, 30 years ago, something like that. Uh, you can also do it with uh, um, different sorts of noises, which are discrete, and you would really have jumps. I mean, Klaus Möllmer, who is here, knows this very well because he did that also 30 years, something years ago. So you can do it also and that would, with these uh, jump, uh, jump operators or jump processes, and that would be much closer in spirit to uh, intuitionistic mathematics. Thank you. Next question, we have uh, Richard East. Hi. <clears throat> uh, hi. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting talk. And um, I think I'm, in general, extremely sympathetic to the idea that real numbers aren't real. Um, and even this like sort of novelty emerging is kind of interesting and I'm sympathetic to that also. But it crosses my mind, I don't know if it's a trivial question ultimately, that how much of this would be solved by just saying there are no real numbers, there are only rational numbers. Um, you've got interacting integers at best and all the continuity we see is just because at a certain granularity we can't tell the difference. Um, outside of the, I understand those arguments of okay, you can maybe get some quantum mechanical things out of this. Um, but outside of that particular point, 
how much of this is actually necessary? Why not just go down the route of, okay, there's, there's, no, there's no real numbers, that's something made up. Let's just have rational numbers and get on with our lives. Yeah, okay. So I guess two answers. First, rational numbers would probably not be sufficient even for the harmonic oscillator because you want to be able to compute sinuses and cosines and the sinus of a rational number is not a rational number. So maybe you want like to go to a computable numbers. Um, the, 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 the danger there, especially with the rational numbers, is that you would have that every chaotic system is actually periodic. It would have to, you know, to repeat itself again and again. And you can, of course, say, oh, it's going to repeat itself only after such a long time that I don't really care. But at least conceptually, it's very different from having, you know, uh, an open future and having the future looking exactly like the past. Okay, I, I think I see your point. Um, <laughs> and in to I'm not entirely convinced, I admit, but uh, yeah, things like sine functions and this, I mean, you can approximate them again and say, okay, I have a mathematical function that's secretly going to obey all the things I need. It just at a certain granularity looks like sine. Um, Go down like a hyperreal numbers route, so you can uh, approximate all the things you'd secretly want. Yeah, yeah again, I don't know. The, the real goal is how to describe time in physics. And I think the possibility of using evolving numbers, so to have to, to put this time all the way down to mathematics, I find that very attractive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A couple more questions uh, by Guido. Uh, hello, Nicolas. Thanks for your talk. Oh. Uh, I've got, you know, what, what do you think about the following scenario? Suppose Alice and Bob are two intuitionistic mathematicians, and they're both working on the Goldbach conjecture, and they both uh, construct intuitionistic proofs of the Goldbach conjecture or its negation. And they do that at space-like separation from each other. Um, would uh, uh, their answers uh, be correlated? Would they both agree that uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's true, or both agree that it's negation? Yeah. Okay. So I, I do not base my intuitionistic mathematics on this Goldbach conjecture or this ideal mathematician, as I have emphasized but on these natural random processes. But now you could, of course, assume that Alice and Bob control or are, are located at uh, positions where you have these natural random processes. And then you could assume that they are uncorrelated. That would make it the, the, the easiest of all. And then just, uh, you know, the events, a flow of events on Alice's side and flow of independent events on Bob's side. Um, now, if you would introduce uh, correlations between these two, uh, natural random processes, then you would get things very similar to quantum non-locality. Uh, and you could indeed even imagine that the, the difference between these two flow of events has a smaller indeterminacy than the local indeterminacy, exactly as we have with Bell inequalities. So you could play all these games. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, let's hope someone does that someday. Um, okay, uh, but uh, I mean, is there is there is there a way of saying, you know, that they are uh, you know, trying to compute the same number um, you know, at at well, space? Alice, space. Sorry to interrupt, Guido, but Alice and Bob, in, in in my view of intuitionistic mathematics, no one is trying to compute a number. This is a purely natural uh, process that outputs some random bits. It's like if you have two uh, true random number generator, quantum or not quantum, they just each of them output uh, bits, random bits, uh, with no one trying to compute a number. It just comes out whatever comes out. Yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah, I, I, I see your point. Uh, 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 yeah, no, I, I was just, I, I, ju I was just trying to, you know, run a kind of EPR mm -hmm. argument. Uh, uh, yes, anyway, uh, of course, yes. I mean, if, if they just have these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, um, how do you call them, uh, natural uh, processes. number of processes, uh, then, yeah, uh, then 
I think, the, yeah, there's no a priori intuition uh, uh, about uh, you know, this being the same number. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, if, uh, uh, if we were talking about the, uh, the Goldbach conjecture, you know, then, I mean, there's, uh, um, I don't know, um, you know uh, uh, there's perhaps an intuition uh, you know, that uh, you know, if, 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 if two mathematicians produce a proof, uh, you know, then uh, you know, uh, they're going to agree. And uh, you know, so, yeah. so you know, that's, that's why, you know, but uh, um, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you if 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 you are not uh, if you are not doing uh, uh, yeah uh, if you're not including uh, you know that kind of uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, intuitionistic uh, you know uh, uh, yeah if you're limiting yourselves to these to these uh, to these uh, natural uh, number processes uh, you know, then uh, um, yeah I, I guess I can't I can't quite push that line. Okay, Renato uh, had a question. Renato? Hey, yes, um, so thanks first, Nicola, um, for the talk. It was also nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> As you said before, it would be nicer to have a beer together. But um, my question is a bit similar to the one of um, Richard, or let's say the concern, because I always think, don't we, in your program, which I really appreciate, only go kind of halfway, in the sense that we could just from at some point say, let's only consider finite quantities. The universe is finite. You don't even need, let's say, Bekenstein bounds or, or black holes. You could even say all information we can ever gain about the world around us is finite. And the, and the real numbers are then just a mathematical convenience. Of course, it would be very inconvenient whenever I take, um, I calculate something. I take, for example, a square root of two. I have to take into account that two was not exactly two, and therefore the square root does is only approximation. So it's convenient to work with real numbers. But so my question is maybe to what extent are we really talking about a physics question? So assume that someone would not agree with your program and say, no, real numbers are real. Would you ever get at any point where you could say there is? an actual physics difference in a world where we anyway only have finite information. Okay, let me, uh, yeah, I hope, yes, I don't have the answer today, but I hope, yes, you know, I, I would like, <clears throat> sorry, I would like to be able to really develop this, uh, this program and really describe, um, you know, the passage of time and indeterminacy in a kind of language that physicists uh, understand. And uh, the hope is that at some point we'll be able to, uh, to do new physics with that and with this possible new physics, um, then possibly there would be the answer to your question or to this uh, question of doing everything just with rational or uh, only computable numbers. Um, but I think in order to really, you know, make this big next step in physics, we need a description of the passage of time. Time, the way physics, today's physics describes time is, is, uh, is much too, too lean, is, uh, is not satisfactory. And I think this is also where this, the tension between quantum and relativity comes in. We, we, we don't have a way of talking about time uh, and, and probably that's what blocks physics today. But this is more a hope and a program than a a theorem, it's certainly not a theorem. And thanks. A couple more questions. There's a time who had a question. Yes, thank you for, for your talk and for seeing Hi. you. Uh, Hi, time. Seeing you. Hi. Um, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, applying intuitionism to physics, of course, renders a lot of statements about, like mathematical statements about the physical universe indeterminate. And amongst those are statements about the future, but uh, presumably also statements about the present would become indeterminate or yeah. unprovable. So I was particularly thinking of uh, the example of the statement that there is a particle which interacts with nothing in the universe, which is kind of an entertaining example, I think, because uh, we, don't, we don't even have a hope of proving whether it is true or false. Uh, unlike the Goldbach conjecture, where we can hope that we can find a proof someday. I was just thinking, what's your, your view on this? 
whether this from a from an intuitionist viewpoint should also have a truth value or not no no um but well, maybe first I should say for, for all the others that Tyne wrote a, a remarkable bachelor thesis on intuitionism applied to physics. I don't remember the title exactly. So, um, yeah, no, so in intuitionism, there are things indeed that are indeterminate, at present indeterminate, and that makes the future open. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everything is indeterminate. There are still, for instance, in classical mechanics, there are still um, integrable dynamical systems. Okay, your particle not interacting with anything or just a harmonic oscillator. When we make a clock, I mean, these boring clocks that we have in train stations and everywhere, they are made on purpose to be as predictable as possible. They should move exactly one hour per hour. Um, and so they are clearly objects in uh, out there in nature, but also in our theories, including in, with intuitionistic mathematics, that are perfectly deter, uh, determined. Um, the interesting is that there are also objects that are not determined, that are indeterminate. But again, for, for your particle alone in the universe or in a, in, a, in a part of the universe, this particle might be uh, initially fully determined and its evolution until it meets some something also fully determined. Thank you. Okay, we were supposed to take a break between the, the talks, so I think we will stop here. Um, the next talk will start in five minutes. Uh, thank you again, Nicola, and of course, if you if you want to to continue discussing, no. uh, and I, I know that. A few others had some questions, so feel free to, to discuss. And we'll uh, start the next talk in five minutes. Maybe I stop sharing so I can see.